This video is sponsored by Brilliant.org. More on that at the end of the video. Hi, my name is Siavish. Previously on this channel, Matt has done an eight-part series on the family tree of Christian denominations. Along with that, he has also made a video about Jewish denominations. So, naturally, today we're going to take a look at the denominations of the third Abrahamic faith, Islam. Like with Judaism, denominations in Islam aren't as clear-cut as they are in Christianity. It's not uncommon for people to hold a mix of beliefs from different denominations. The term denomination itself might not apply here very accurately. Let's get into it and I'll explain along the way. The first thing I would like to address is that most religions have multiple stories of their origins. Typically, there's one or more traditional accounts along with one or more academic accounts. For example, as Matt mentioned in his video on Judaism, while Jews believe their religion to have begun when Moses received the Torah, academic scholars believe it to have emerged out of a mix of ancient Israelite, Egyptian, and Mesopotamian religions. Similarly, for Islam, there's a traditional account that states that Islam began with Adam, the first human, and subsequent prophets, which include Noah, Moses, and Jesus, preached Islam, but in a different form. Finally, it came into its current shape with Prophet Muhammad when he received the first revelation of the Qur'an in 610 CE or so. However, academic scholars believe that Islam came out of the mixing of various religions, which included the ancient Arabic pagan religious traditions and a group of people known as Jewish Christians, specifically the Ebionites and the Nazarenes, who upheld the laws of Judaism but also believed Jesus to be a messiah. They may have fled into Arabia to avoid persecution, where they inspired the religion of Islam. Islamic tradition mentions a group of people known as Hanifs, who followed the, quote, true monotheism of Prophet Abraham, which may or may not have been these Jewish Christians. Anyhow, according to Islamic tradition, Islam began with the revelation of the Qur'an to the Prophet Muhammad around 610 CE. From then to his death around 632, the Prophet continued to receive revelations from Allah, the Arabic word for God, which were later compiled into a book format known as the Qur'an or recitation. The Qur'an forms the core of Islam and is universally held up by Muslims as the highest authority on their religion. They might disagree on interpretations of the Qur'an, but all Muslims hold it up above everything else. In 622, around 11 or 12 years after the first revelation, the Prophet went into exile from his birth city of Mecca and formed a community in a city called Yathrib, which later came to be known as Medina. This emigration of the Prophet is known as the Hijrah and is considered a very important point in the history of Islam. So much so that this year marks the beginning of the Islamic lunar calendar. It also marks a changing point in the Qur'an. The Qur'an is divided into 114 chapters known as the surahs. The Meccan chapters, which were revealed during the Prophet's time in Mecca, focus more on, for the lack of a better term, abstract concepts. To generalize, the Qur'an talks about things such as Tawheed or monotheism, the oneness of God, the day of judgment or, as it's called in the Qur'an, the hour when the world will end and humanity will be resurrected to face the final judgment for where they'd spend eternity, heaven or hell. In other words, these chapters focused on theology. However, after the Hijrah, the Qur'an started talking more about, again for the lack of a better term, matters of the world. Because in Medina, the Prophet wasn't just a Prophet, he was also a political leader, so he had to arbitrate over disputes, go to war, do diplomacy, etc. So the Qur'an also focuses on such matters at this point. In other words, these chapters focused on jurisprudence or law. This is important because in Islam there are two important distinctions when it comes to what one believes. The first is your aqidah, which deals with the theological nature of Islam, while the second, the fiqh, deals with the judicial nature of Islam. 
Where the fiqh deals with what to do with lawbreakers, the aqidah deals with why someone becomes one. Where the fiqh would say that the punishment for someone who commits a particular sin is this or that, the aqidah would ask whether the sinner has free will or whether everything is predestined. These two do overlap and the aqidah does guide the fiqh, but not always. The Prophet Muhammad passed away in 632 and immediately cracks began appearing in the community of the believers. The first point of disagreement was who would lead the community as its new political leader. Some senior followers of the Prophet elected his close friend Abu Bakr as the first Khalifa or Caliph. Caliph simply means successor or deputy. The Caliph was to be the new political leader of the believers and was known as Amir al-Mu'minin or literally the leader of the believers. However, another party of the followers of the Prophet wanted Ali ibn Abi Talib the cousin and son-in-law of the Prophet, to succeed him as Caliph. It's tempting to call this decision as having laid the foundation of the division between the Sunnis and the Shias, the two largest sects of Islam. However, these two sects wouldn't really crystallize till the 11th century, so it would be better to call these two groups Proto-Shias and Proto-Sunnis. The division is often oversimplified by saying that the Proto-Sunnis were the ones who supported Abu Bakr, while the proto-Shias were the ones who supported Ali. Initially, this was the case. The division was merely about who would lead the community. However, over time, the division began to get more and more complex. This was because the community expanded really quickly. During the Prophet's lifetime, he conquered and allied with much of the Arabian Peninsula. After him, the caliphs sent their armies into the greater Middle East. Within a few decades, the believers ruled everything between Tunisia and India. In the process, they defeated the Byzantine and the Sassanid empires. As you might expect, this huge empire brought its own problems. The caliphs had to make judgments and policies in political, social, and military matters. The believers tried to follow the law laid down in the Quran as it was and is the highest authority. With things that weren't directly addressed in the Qur'an, the believers looked at the examples laid down by the Prophet in his lifetime. These examples, along with his sayings, formed a canon of the Islamic tradition known as the Sunnah of the Prophet. However, there were still many, many things that had no direct parallels in the Qur'an or the Sunnah. How do we resolve that? This question divided the Muslims further. Let's first look at how the Sunnis answered this question. Again, to grossly oversimplify, the proto-Sunnis, who get their name from the Sunnah, believed that the examples of the Prophet can guide the believers along with the opinions and comments of learned men and occasionally women who came to be known as the ulama and who had spent considerable portions of their lives studying the Quran and the Sunnah. The ulama weren't exactly priests, but they were not that dissimilar to rabbis. In fact, a lot of Islamic jurisprudence has parallels with Jewish law. Anyhow, among the ulama, there were some distinguished figures who are more venerated than the others, who came to be known as the imams. While Sunni imams were respectable figures who were considered authorities on the subject of jurisprudence, they weren't infallible and they were merely educated human beings. However, the proto-Shias believed that their imams were infallible. They believed that the imam has to be a descendant of the Prophet through his daughter Fatima and her husband Ali ibn Abu Talib. The proto-Shias believed that the imam had divine guidance and was the sole authority on how to interpret the Quran and the traditions of the Prophet. Ali ibn Abi Talib is considered the first imam. And then his two sons, Al Hassan and Al Hussein, are considered the second and third, respectively. The disagreement over imams and their role in Islamic society is perhaps the biggest distinction between the Sunnis and the Shias, even today. Both have their own chains of imams who are considered founders of their various schools of Islamic jurisprudence and developed their own interpretations of Islamic law known as the Sharia. However, it must be kept in mind that back in the day, this wasn't a binary division. Rather, it was more of a spectrum where people could and did mix elements from both. Let's look at Sunnis first. 
Sunnis make up roughly 90% of the Muslim population, with roughly 9% being Shia and the rest making up less than 1%. Among the Sunnis, there are four schools of jurisprudence or fiqh. These are the Hanafi, which is the largest and is most popular in India, Pakistan, Turkey and parts of the Middle East. The Maliki, which is popular in Africa and previously was the predominant school in Muslim Spain. Then the Shafi'i and Hanbali, both of which are mostly common in the Middle East, with the Hanbali being dominant in Saudi Arabia. There used to be a fifth one named Zahiri, which was popular in Muslim Spain and northwestern Africa. But it has since died out, but recently with the Islamic revivalist movements, it is starting to make a comeback. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now, early on in its life, Islam came into contact with the Greeks and their way of thinking. So, there was a debate in the Islamic world about what way of thinking should be followed. Should we adhere rigidly to the Quran and the Sunnah, or should a logical approach to rational thinking be developed for our worldly problems? This led to the creation of the schools of theology. The Athari are considered the traditionalists who stick to the Quran and Sunnah, while the Mu'tazilites are seen as those who follow reason and rational thinking much more. The Ashari and the Maturidi are somewhere in between. Although the division between these schools, which are quite clear in theory, weren't as neat in practice. For example, the Mu'tazilites, while claiming to be rationalists and progressive, were behind one of the biggest inquisitions in Islamic history. This inquisition also stopped Islam from having something of a pope. A little bit about that inquisition, which is called the Mihna. It was during the reign of Abbasid Caliph al mamun The main question was about the nature of the Qur'an whether it was created at the time of revelation to the Prophet, or whether it had always existed. The implications of that were that if the Qur'an had always existed since the beginning of time, then it is true for all times and its interpretations cannot change or be updated over time. However, if it was created at the time of revelation, then it meant that the Qur'an applied only to that time and its meaning can be changed according to the times. Al-Mamun believed in himself as being the Imam and having the power to define Islamic theology and jurisprudence rather than the body of learned men and women known as the Ulama. The Mu'tazilites supported him while the most ardent opponent was Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, the founder of the Hanbali school. People were forced to support Al-Mamun's doctrine of the created Qur'an and refusal led to imprisonment, torture, seizure of property, etc. When the Inquisition failed, the Mu'tazilites fell into decline and eventually died out. But recently, people have been claiming to be neo-Mu'tazilites and trying to revive the rationalist thinking that is often imagined as being the core of their doctrine. Since the Mihna failed, Sunni caliphs never again tried to have the power to define Islamic theology and jurisprudence directly. This is why Sunni Islam has no head of faith like the Pope. Over time, the schools of theology and the schools of jurisprudence came to be associated with each other. For example, the Hanbalis follow the Athari school, while the Hanafis follow the Maturidi one. The Hanbalis stick to a more literal meaning of the Quran and Sunnah, while the Hanafis, being a centrist school, do use some rational thinking as well, along with analogy and consensus to form judgments. However, for most Muslims today, their school of theology aren't very clear. They usually identify with the madhab or school of jurisprudence more than the school of theology. In fact, even mosques can be named after the madhab of the people who manage them. Usually in Muslim majority countries, people tend to go to the mosque that is managed by the people of their own madhab because mosques are primarily used for prayers and the way to pray also changes from madhab to madhab. However, in Western countries, people go to whatever mosque is available as long as it follows their sect, i.e. the Sunni one or the Shia one. In the 18th century, the Muslim world began to lose much of its power as the Ottoman and Mughal empires entered an era of decline and the Europeans began to take over. At this point, Muslims faced the question of why this had happened. Many scholars came to the conclusion that Muslims had slid away from true Islam and had become sinful, which led to this decline. As a result, many revivalist movements appeared in the Islamic world. 
The first one came from India under a man named Shah Waliullah Dehlvi in the early and mid 18th century. He advocated for Muslims to stop following medieval imams, such as the founders of the four madhabs, and instead focus on learning for themselves what the Quran and the Sunnah teach. He and his son even translated the Quran into Persian and Urdu respectively, which were the two dominant languages among Indian Muslims at the time, to make the Quran more accessible to the people. Towards the end of the 18th century, another reformer was active in what is today Saudi Arabia. His name was Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab. He also advocated for a similar disassociation with the medieval imams and their schools and for re-evaluating the Quran and Sunnah. Over time, his doctrine, known as Wahhabism, came to become dominant in Saudi Arabia. Wahhabis are often put in the same box as the Ahle Hadith who were born in India. The two movements might have even inspired each other. They're both غير مقلد, meaning they claim to not adhere to any medieval school, but in fact, they do kind of adhere to the Hanbali one. They call themselves Salafi after the Salafi movement, which advocated for a return of Muslims to the ways of the Aslaf or the elders, meaning the first generation of Muslims. The Wahhabis are a bit more fundamentalist, if you will, while the Ahli Hadith are a bit more moderate. The Ahli Hadith came from the followers of Shah Waliullah along with the Deobandis who follow Shah Waliullah but also adhere to the Hanafi Madhab. They along with the Barelvis are the majority of the Muslims in India and Pakistan. The Barelvis are kind of Hanafis mixed with a lot of Sufism. So while the Ahli Hadith, the Wahhabis and the Deobandis don't like Sufism, the Barelvis do. Quite a lot actually. Speaking of the Sufis, we're not going to be talking about them in detail here because they're very complicated. Sufism is a mystical form of Islam and they have many orders and brotherhoods that believe in a range of religious traditions. Some are strictly Shia, some are strictly Sunni, while the rest are somewhere in between. Then we have the Shias. We have another video on the lines of the Shia Imams, so be sure to watch that one to get a better understanding of their individual lines. But anyhow, Shias believe in the infallible Imams from the descendants of the Prophet. While these Imams were alive, they didn't need to form schools of jurisprudence in the same way that Sunnis had to, but eventually they did as well. I think an interesting point of how flexible the Shia-Sunni split was early on is that the founder of the Hanafi school, the biggest school of the Sunnis, was a student of Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, the founder of the biggest Shia school. Among the Shias, the main three subsects are the Zaydis, who believe in the Imamate of Zaid ibn Ali and believe that the Imam must also fight for the Caliphate. They're found mostly in Yemen. Then we have the Ismailis and the Twelvers. The Twelvers are the majority of the Shias today at around 85%. Both the Ismailis and the Twelvers, who are also known as the Imamiyas, follow the teachings of Imam Jafar al-Sadiq. Generally speaking, the Shias do believe in the Sunnah of the Prophet as well, but they only take parts of the Sunnah that are narrated by companions of the Prophet who sided with Ali. These parts of the Sunnah are then interpreted by the Imams, whose teachings are followed then by the Shias. There was also another subsect known as the Seveners, who are now considered extinct. All three of these Jafari subsects were divided over the succession to Imam Jafar al Sadiq. Again, watch the other video. The Ismailis were a much more active group in the 9th and 10th centuries. They formed their own caliphate in Egypt in 969 and considered their caliphs to be imams as well. As a result, their jurisprudence also has teachings from the Fatimid imams along with those of Imam Jafar. They became further divided over succession. However, there were some groups of the Ismailis that rejected the Fatimid caliphate and formed their own subsects. All of these are now considered extinct, but the most popular are the Karmatians, who are universally reviled by Muslims because they sacked the city of Mecca in 930 and stole the sacred black rock. From the Fatimids eventually appeared a group of people known as the Druze, who aren't considered Muslim and are a major religious group in Syria today. Their theology is quite secretive and unknown to most outsiders. One of the things that they believe in is the reincarnation of the soul. 
the Twelvers became the dominant group in Iran during the Safavid Empire's reign. They themselves had a disagreement that led to what can be called their own madhabs, the Usuli and the Akhbari. The Akhbari formed the majority of the Twelver Shias and believe in only using their traditional teachings to form judgments, while the Usuli believe that reasoning can and should be used as well. One branch of the Twelvers eventually became the Alawites, who live primarily in Syria and Turkey. They're not considered Muslim by most other sects of Islam. They're often confused with the Alevis, who are in a similar Islamhood disputed situation, but they're probably more of a Sufi order than a Shia subgroup. Finally, the Babist and the Baha'i faiths also come from the Twelver Shias. While they're certainly not Muslim, they do hold on to a lot of things from the Shias. In episode 6 of Matt's Christian Denominations Family Tree series, he talked about the Millerites, who believed that Jesus would be returning in the year 1844. The lack of Jesus' return led to the event known as the Great Disappointment among their followers. However, some Baha'i believe that Christ did return in 1844 as Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith, declared himself to be the Mahdi, a messianic figure who is to return, according to both Shias and Sunnis, around the end of time. Rain Wilson, who plays Dwight Schrute on The Office, is a member of the Baha'i faith. The third major sect of Islam is popularly known as the Kharijites. However, we've used the term Muhakkima here. Okay, I won't go into too much detail, you can check out my videos on Al Muqaddimah for that, but there was a civil war between Ali ibn Abi Talib and Muawiyah ibn Abu Sufyan, known as the first fitna. Ali was the caliph and Muawiyah was the governor of Syria, who refused to recognize Ali as caliph. They went to war and faced each other in the Battle of Sifin, where there was so much bloodshed that the two sides agreed to arbitrate instead of fighting. Some of the people on Ali's side, which by the way was called the Shiatul Ali, that's where the name Shia comes from, decided that this was wrong. They believed that Muawiyah had, by fighting the caliph, gone against Islam, so he must be fought until he was defeated. Arbitration, they said, was against the law of God. They left Ali's camp and formed a third side known as the Kharijites, or those who left. They were the very first actual division in the believers' community. The Kharijites followed a very rigid and extreme interpretation of Islam and stuck to a our way or death approach. However, these days the Kharijites are said to be extinct. Rather, a more moderate version of them called Ibadis can be found in countries like Oman. They prefer not to be called Kharijites and claim to have nothing to do with them, which is why they are shown here as having branched off from the Muhakkimah rather than from each other. The Muhakkimah is the term used for the people who left Ali's camp. There were other offshoots of the Kharijites as well throughout history, but most of them have gone extinct over the centuries, and Ibadis are pretty much the only major group of this branch left. They're found as the majority of the population in Oman. Finally, we have two groups of people that call themselves Muslims, but their Muslimhood is extremely disputed. The first are the Ahmadis. They were founded by a man named Mirza Ghulam Ahmad in India. Almost all other groups of Muslims accuse the Ahmadis of uplifting Mirza Ghulam Ahmad to the level of a prophet and hence call them non-Muslims because according to Islam, Prophet Muhammad is the last prophet and claiming that anyone after him is a prophet is going against the very fundamental beliefs of Islam. Hence, other than the Ahmadis, no one considers them Muslims. This goes so far that I'm sure there will be people in the comments telling us that we shouldn't even mention them in a video about Muslims at all because they're not Muslim. Then we have the Nation of Islam, founded by Wallace Fard Muhammad. The Nation of Islam is popular in the US, specifically among black Americans. Like the Baha'i, the members of the Nation of Islam claim that the founder, Wallace Muhammad, was the Mahdi and perhaps even divine to some extent. Some of its most famous members are Elijah Muhammad, who succeeded Fard Muhammad, and Malcolm X, who left the Nation of Islam in 1964 to follow more mainstream Islam. Elijah Muhammad's son, Wallace, took the Nation of Islam in the direction of becoming more mainstream and hence closer to Sunni Islam. Eventually, he dissolved the old Nation of Islam. 
However, Louis Farrakhan revived it and so it still exists today. So that was a look at the denominations of Islam. As I mentioned, we have other videos on the family trees of other religions, including Christianity and Judaism. And if you aren't already, do subscribe for videos about other religious denominations as well. Now, before I go, I should mention one more thing. Most Islamic denominations actually came about in the 9th and 10th centuries during an era known as the Islamic Golden Age. During this period, Muslim scholars worked in many fields of study such as jurisprudence, theology, philosophy, architecture, etc. However, perhaps the most important field of study was mathematics. To do so, they had to collect books from places as far off as Greece and India. Then they had to translate those books so they could learn from them. However, thanks to today's sponsor, Brilliant, you don't have to go through all that to learn and understand fields such as math, data science, and computer science. Brilliant.org is an amazing interactive learning tool that can help you gain new skills in a fun, visual way. As you know, I work at Useful Charts and it's in my contract that I have to love charts almost as much as Matt does, which as it turns out, I already do. So visual learning is super important to me and my job. And one of the areas that Brilliant focuses on is data analysis, which just happens to be a key step when it comes to making charts and infographics. So I decided to try out their course called Exploring Data Visually. And as it turns out, it was right up my alley. It taught me a lot about how to visualize data to make it simpler and easier to understand. It's been proven time and time again that the best way to learn is by doing and I really like how Brilliant utilizes this type of learning to make learning fun and easy. The whole process is very intuitive and easy to get into. Plus, since you're learning at your own pace in bite-sized pieces, it's very low pressure. If that sounds good to you, you should definitely try Brilliant. All you have to do is go to brilliant.org slash useful charts to get a 30 day free trial. The first 200 people to sign up will get 20% off their annual subscription. So don't wait. Thanks for watching.